Welcome to the first edition of the pregame pod. I'm Matt Ryan, and this week we'll be looking around the A7FL with some of the best and brightest names across the league. We'll hear from Woody Nash Charles, we'll hear from Zach Morgan, we'll hear from Dub Alvarez and more. But we start in the Northeast where it was the BIC and the U in week three under the lights in the biggest matchup of the regular season. Let's go back to the three-on-one podcast where Rob Fabian, Corey Hammond, and myself broke down that big matchup. BIC did have the game control, right? They, they were kind of the team in control most of the game. The, the U never really went away the, as the U wouldn't. And I'm sure at, at some individual moments, you guys kind of looked at what was happening on, on, on the screen. They were breaking kayfabe there. On the screen, and you were like, yeah, yeah the U might come back. But that differential, to me, had everything to do with the Asbury bounce, that miraculous just doink, and right back to BIC on that return. To me, that's what made it the two-score game. Um, much like other, you know, knockout, dragout fights between these two two teams, the football was high level. So I don't think anybody looks at the U and says that they ass. Except for maybe Kayla. Uh, there, there were some things we saw in that game that a couple of teams might feel like they can exploit. They saw with dominant offensive line play that they used defensive line, who is really good, can look quite mediocre in some ways. And I, I don't know. We're we're, we, we're talking about we're talking about specifically the one dude, and we'll talk about him later. I don't know sure. how many teams can look at their roster and be like, yeah, let's copy that. That's the formula for sure, for sure. Yeah. But then there was things that happened in that game, and there's something else that I think we didn't really mention anywhere, but some of those guys on the U played flag. Yeah. Some of them played that morning. Some of them played the day before. Hell, hell. You know? so help is important, and I was that was one of my biggest problems with BIC last year. I was about Prior to ask, Rob, is this, yeah. the, is this the limitation? Is this the wall that the BIC ran into last year? Mm-hmm. I do believe that it's, it's something very similar. Certain players not showing up. I don't even think the U was fully staffed. They didn't have Dion. There was a few guys missing. Um, honestly, priorities, man. Like, I get it. You know, flag's important, but if you can't have some of your best players playing flag and then hopping up to an A7 game and thinking it's sweet. Like, it's just not that. And, you know, it's not. Was it that important of a game? Can we be honest? No. Does it change a lot? No, it doesn't really change a lot. It just moves some people around, but... I'm, I promise you the U's not home soaking and depressed about losing the BIC. They know what they lost to, and if they're the team that they think they are, they'll make the adjustments to beat them the second time they play. Two things, and then I think we'll wrap up the U, right? This rivalry has always given the edge, in my opinion, to the team that is really is more motivated to get the revenge. The other thing is, is that this rivalry in almost every instance has always gone to whoever has the better offensive line. Just like in 2022 BIC's championship year where the U lost multiple games in the regular season, one of their worst regular season efforts that they've ever put out in an A7FL season, they still made the championship and only lost to BIC by two. So even though it sounds like I'm trying to hedge the bet so that the, the you guys don't choke slam me, they're still going to choke slam me. One of my yeah. great friends in a scrimmage, Big Mo, <laughs> Ryan Shamar says, hey, let's let's keep it easy on the quarterbacks. They got us to play a season. And first play leveled me in a scrimmage. So in a game on television, I'm sure it's going to be the same respect that I would expect from all of those guys. And they are literally going to try to put me in a grave. However, the last thing anybody should do is look at a great dynastic team and and quickly go to write their obituary. A little bit later on in the podcast, we will be hearing from Jaquan Mason and also Zach Morgan about what's going on in the Northeast as we prepare you for week four of the A7FL's 10th season. But let's go down south a little bit. Let's have a bit of a parlay with Woody Nash Charles and Joey Bate. And then when we come back, we'll see what's going on out west this is the pregame pod. Mark Bagway, when and if he's going to show up. Where's the wrinkle so, in that one? So thank you for setting that stage, Woody. 
So the big the big when and if Bagway shows up to play for the Nightcrawlers, we had actually heard that he was on two rosters, the Nightcrawlers, which we knew, and he was also registered for the BIC comments. Mark Bagway is 100%, 100% playing for BIC and will be making his debut for the Watchmen. Against BIC. So Sunday, Sunday, April 28th. So mark that down on your calendars. Definitely be on the lookout to see because, again, in the broadcast, I was I was tuned in. I watched uh, – it was a full day of A7. I watched the, the DC Buzz play the Snow Tribe, and I, lo- I was locked in for that game, that second game, 4 o'clock game as well. Um, I was locked in, and I heard them even state, you know, Hey, if, if if he plays for BIC, he won't even be playing quarterback, you know, which is understandable. Like I gave the praise to Stary because Stary is the conductor of that orchestra. I think that, you know, Mark Bagway showing up there and playing, you know, wide receiver corner for the BIC. That's a that's an uh, embarrassment of riches <laughs> for the BIC if that's something that does happen. What's uh? What's the likelihood do you think of that, Joey? Man, I I don't know. I really don't know. And what BIC took off salary cap. They they have no <laughs> salary cap. They went out, they got everybody. If, yeah. if that if that's a case. And what is what does that do to the night crawlers? If they if they learn their their number one player, the player that got them out of the trenches and essentially wheeled them to that championship game is no longer on the team. Does Logo Davis come back to the Nightcrawlers, knowing that he's not going to be playing us alongside? What happens to the quarterback situation in Tampa? Does that? How does that affect the Orlando Ghosts and the O-Town Orange? Will those two teams come a little bit harder, knowing that that team might be a little bit psychologically out of it, knowing all of that is going on? Oh, because they'll never admit know, that, Woody. though. They'll never admit that no. they're psychologically, you know. But come on, this is call a spade a spade. If the best player in your team now, you know, isn't playing with you guys anymore, and you know, as a lot of people say, a lot of those guys show up to play with Bagway. Bagway's not there anymore. What happens? There's a lot. There's a big ripple effect. That's the point you were making. <laughs> A7FL Indianapolis gets their first home game ever as the Octane hosted the Crush this past Sunday. It would take both teams some time to get their offenses into the end zone, but Tyler Pennington and the QC Crush would strike first late in the first as he and Theo Smith would link up to make it 6-0. Pennington's arm would be integral as he would find Michael Bell on this 53-yard tutty on fourth down to give the Crush a 12-0 lead until the 121 mark of the first half as Diamond Price would shine with his first TD of the day to James Mitchell. Then in the second half, the Octane would start revving their engines, scoring 18 unanswered points from the end of the first half, including championship points, which were paying a premium last week in Indianapolis. And while many had questions about the Octane heading into week three, you can't question the talent. Chris Butler hussing all over the new hometown of Caitlin Clark and looking more effective than the University of Iowa football team to help lead to the TD that would give the Octane their first lead of the day. But then controversy would run rampant like a Pawnee public forum as this play would be called a crush touchdown. But as you can see here on review, it could or should have been called an interception. And then from there, the Octane would stall as Price would throw a costly pick to Lovell Anderson. But the very next drive, Pennington would give up the goat and score a touchdown the wrong way as Brandon Garst would get that INT back and give Indy the lead. But hold on to your butts as this game's pace would be kicked into high gear as Theo Smith would put six more on the board as he would slip slide to the house and be down only one point. And then the crush said, bleep going for the tie, we're going for the win, as they would hit the two-point conversion. But Price would drive the octane right back down to the other side of the 50, but on this run would be taken to the sideline after that late hit, 
And then with the game and a chance for their first win at home, Logan Wog would be intercepted near the goal line as the Crush would get their first W of the season, 26-25 against the Octane. Let's look at scores around the Midwest in Week 3 as the Heist beat Columbus 41-25 and the Chaos continued to impress as they decimated the Volcanoes 75-6. And that leads us to standings in the Midwest as the Chaos and the Heist are at the top of the division. 3-0 apiece, Chaos on top because of the point differential. The three spot going to the Crush after beating the Octane despite both being 1-2 and, and the Explorers and the Volcanoes are at the bottom of the division as the Explorers look for their first win ever as an expansion team in the A7FL, and they may get their chance to do that when they open up week four against the Octane this morning at 10 o'clock, and the Crush look for their second win of the season as they face the Volcanoes at one, but then at four o'clock, it's the biggest showdown of the year in the Midwest as the Heist and the Chaos square off in the Battle of the Natty. All these games will be live on A7FL.TV. Week three opened up with the buzz and the Snow Tribe in the Northeast and the Snow Tribe defense tried to feast on Lenny Hedrick, but highlighter yellow jerseys make it easy to spot your players. They get that playoff there. But then here comes Mike Liberti and Trey Baskerville. The Snow Tribe defense were effective on Sunday, not allowing an offensive touchdown. And the Rahway Snow Tribe, well, they would give up a couple of defensive touchdowns, including here Mike Liberti giving the ball up on a fumble and then ending up in the end zone. You gotta keep that ball out of the blue. Six nothing, DC Buzz, and you'll see it here on the replay. Just no one there for him. Liberti gets wrapped up, tries to toss the ball like he's done a million times, can't get the momentum, and then boing, boing. Oh, no, oh, oh no, oh, Grandma, no, oh, no. And then right in there into the end zone, making this one a buzz lead, six to nothing. And then Keel throwing one hell of a dot to make this one a bit closer and more contentious. And here we see Jonathan Keels just setting up Shug. Big B button, driving through, getting past blockers and then seeing nothing but daylight in front of him. The only offensive touchdown of the game scored on this big run by Shug, making it six to six. And then the one point conversion, a catch you dream about, Mike Liberti dragging that one in there to make it seven six. Let's take a look at that one again. You call that one a head top. You call that one a dream throw. Keels putting it on a line. Liberty one hand drops the knee, gets in there, and makes it 7-6 as the DC Buzz find themselves down here. And this looks like it's all up for the Snow Tribe. They've got the lead. They've got the momentum. And then here comes the bottom falling out. Liberty. Driving down the field, a solid run there. We'll get his jersey taken from him from a defender. Still seven and six, a minute 50 left to go. And there's that aggression, there's that chippiness. The DC Buzz defense were feeling themselves, but Liberty seeing the sideline, tried to stutter step, and then gets his jersey completely removed. And then Keels smothered, covered by yellow jerseys, trying to find someone, anyone in orange to get the ball up and then intercepted. And then it's elementary. My dear Watson, slip slide, put six on the wrong side of the scoreboard for the Snow Tribe as the buzz would get the victory. 13 to seven as the buzz will get their first win of the season and the Snow Tribe will remain winless heading into week four of the A7FL season. They are now 0-2 on the 2024 campaign. And there it was, the extra point, getting it done 13 to seven. Your final score in Asbury Park. It was a game everybody was waiting for, the BIC and the U, and we started off with the BIC dominating with the run game. Trey Robinson and Dave Valley being key players here. Watch this again. Valley going up against Burton. 
Sunglasses don't matter. Cracks through the defense. And Robinson driving through the defenders. Courage Mosey helping up there. And it'll set up this. Sterry Codrington running to his left. That's 2021 Sterry right there. Rookie season Sterry running in, making it 6 to nothing. As the BIC would take an early lead. And then the Patterson U. There's that man, Quattro Huff and Houdini Huff. Setting it up for the first down. And then there it is. Hard body pushing that man. Pushing the pile. Getting into the end zone. Making it 6-7. to seven. And then Jason Sisson on a two-point conversion. Launching that one. Two toes down. Making it 8-7. to seven. But the BIC could not score on their next drive. But the BIC almost get the ball back to you. Fall on that one to keep it. And then Huff which would set up their downfall on this drive, a sack. But it would be Amir Chick Morris with the late hit. But Huff would give up the ball on an INT. And then Sterry Codrington from the one-yard line after the INT would lead this team 99 yards from end zone to end zone to take the lead back. 13-8, and there's that toss back so Ashante Worthy can get another tutty on the year. That made it 13-7, but then Trey Robinson, once again, such a key part for this BIC team when it comes to championship points. And here's the second interception from Huff, a dive bomb throw off the back foot. And then the BIC with under two minutes to play. You see here, 16 seconds. Sterry Codrington to throw to Trey Robinson. He's got Superman on the back of his jersey. He waves bye-bye, making it a two-score lead heading into halftime. And here's the extra point again. The BIC have found new life on special teams. They had trouble with it last season, but Huff putting the team on his back like Greg Jennings to make it a one-score game. But then there he is, Sterry Codrington, thrown to Ashante Worthy to make it again a two-score game. 28-14. to 14. And if you thought that the Patterson U were going to go gently into the good night, you thought wrong. Slip, slide, untimed down. Kyle Ward will slow play that one into the end zone and make this a 28-20 to 20 game. Off the three-on-one, that one will fall out of the hands of Marcellus Pack. But Pack, scrambling to keep that one, not letting an Asbury bounce, cost him and the BIC the lead. And then we switch sides in the fourth quarter. And it's Sterry Codrington one more time. Cha-Cha sliding into the end zone and then taking a little bit of a nap as the BIC offense as that'll be the final score for the BIC in this game but the U trying 205 left to go down two scores and that will put the punctuation mark on this one for the first time since the 2022 championship the BIC have beaten the U and they are heading into week four at the top of the northeast as the only undefeated team as they got the win 35 to 20 in Asbury Park and as you see the buzz and the BIC getting the wins on the week and the BIC taking the top of the Northeast they are three and zero. Oh, the U two and one the Watchmen who got the win over the Renegades are back above 500 for the first time this season they are two and one the animals will be in action at four o'clock they are one and one the DC buzz Taking on the BIC a little bit later today. They are 1-1. One one. The Rahway Snow Tribe 0-2. Oh and, and the East Orange Renegades, who have a date with the Patterson U at 1 o'clock, will be at the 0-3 oh mark at the bottom of the Northeast Division. And we got a question about that. Let's go to some receipts. We got a call from somebody on the A7FL 3-on-1 hotline. That's 516-387-A7FL. That's 516-387-A7FL. Let's give a listen to this man's complaint. Yeah. Hey, hey Matt, it's like fourth quarter, 12 minutes left. Uh, uh, the U gets BIC. You're talking about uh, uh, no matter what, somebody can do something. I'm like, well, what if? What if trend? What if BIC loses the next four games? What are you talking about? They automatically qualified to be in whatever. 
How does that work? I don't know if you get this message. I mean, if you don't and you don't address it on air, that's kind of a rhetorical question. <laughs> I love you and Big Rob. Hey, you're doing a great job. What do you mean, though? If if BIC, if any of these two teams loses the next three to four games, okay, not likely to happen. But what if they're both two and zero? What do you mean somebody's guaranteed to be in whatever? What are you talking about? Anyway, this is Big D in California, watching live, enjoying the broadcast, enjoy yourselves. Peace out. But what are you talking about? Who gets the automatic? There ain't no automatic. There ain't no automatic. It can't be. What are you talking about? Maybe I misunderstood. Whatever. Peace out. All right. Appreciate y'all. I'll call some other day. All right, peace. According to our statistician, Cole Gardella, the current playoff format allows for a team like the BIC, who are 3-0, and and the Renegades, who fell to 0-3, have the plus-one advantage because they beat the Renegades early in the season. So they have that common victory. So even if both teams finished at 3-3, and the BIC have the tiebreaker, so right now, the Renegades are on the outside looking in, in the Northeast playoff, but a lot of things can happen over the next few weeks of A7FL football. So we don't know what's going to happen, but we've got a feeling that the Trenton BIC may be making a strong message. And speaking of strong messages, let's go to Ron Clark, who's got some strong messages about what we're going to see today in the Northeast. Ron, what do you got for us? Thank you, Matt. Snow Tribe still trying to find themselves. Snow Tribe has a good run game, but people sleep on how good the animals D-line is. A ball-headed D-tackle from the animals. Bro is a sleeper. He really clogs up the middle and doesn't get enough credit for what he does, so pay attention to him. The animals basically cousins to the U. They're both from Patterson. They play similar low-key if you pay attention. The defense plays similar if you pay attention. But I can see the animals offense lights out going off. They have two good quarterbacks. The young boy Dave, he can stretch the field with his legs and he can throw the whole field. The Bebo is a vet. He knows how to, he can read the defense. He can really read the defense if you pay attention to how he plays the game. Who you have to look out for in this game is that young boy Dave, the quarterback from the animals. I feel as if he's gonna start. I have my inside sources. He's a legit quarterback. He can run and he can pass. He has a good arm and he's fast. So pay attention to him and how he elevates this game and moving forward. Let me not only just talk about the animals. Snow Tribe also have a good offense. They have a good quarterback and kills that understands the game. But when it's time to pass the ball, that old line can't pass block. But when it's time to run the ball, oh, they got it. Their run blocking is great. The Annals D-line are good run stoppers as well. So when it's time to pass the ball, I don't know. I can't say. But I can't help you, bro. Like, it's over. Like, Kills, you getting sacked quick. You got to run. It's no shot at Snow Tribe O-line, though. But film doesn't lie, bro. Kills has no time to pass the ball. Since Huff is out, he's out until playoffs. You already know the U's going with. He, they're going with Opie. And they're going with moon as the quarterback that changes the whole offense so any film you think you may had on the u it's completely gone now you're gonna see a completely different offense with two different styles of quarterback and matt back to you in the shipping container we look around the northeast and well we have to sit down at the table of one of the men who helped build the northeast the man who's played for the bic and the u it's jaquan mason the man who calls the mason cam how you doing buddy hey i'm doing well how you doing I'm doing great. It's the pregame pod. We finally get you on the show. And the BIC take a trip down to Baltimore this weekend to take on the buzz. What do you think you saw from the buzz last week that can keep them competitive against a BIC team that so far this season is a buzzsaw? They have a tremendous defense led by Lau and one of the premier corners in the league with DK. So if they can keep Starry in check, I think that um, it will be a close game. And when you talk about keeping Starry in check, we saw the ability of Starry Codrington on display last Sunday, being able to extend the field with his arm and his legs. DK Butcher and Loud Wilkes are going to be a huge part of that. But if you had to put one player to spy on Starry Codrington all game, who and what can you sacrifice to keep him from completely ruining the day in D.C.? 
Um, to be honest, I don't think that they have anyone that can, you know, spy him. I think they would just have to contain him with the um, defensive line and just make sure that they have DK on Ashanti all game. And I think that if they do that, then maybe they have a chance. All right, and looking around the rest of the Northeast, Jaquan, what are the things that you think are going to be a huge impact this week in the A7FL? Well, I don't know. I don't know if Huff's playing or not. Last time I checked on uh, the RT Live, I think that um, he said that he was going to be out until the playoffs because I think he either sprained his knee or something like that. So I'm eager to see who who they're going to have at quarterback. Is it either going to be Moon or is it going to be the kid from Baltimore? So um, that's something to look at. And also, a great key matchup is going to be that um, Animals and Snow Tribe game. Because I think the Animals are looking to be a premier top three team in the Northeast. Just my opinion. I think they're better this year than they were last year with Huff. So that's something to look at. And that will be our 4 o'clock matchup on the games of the week. But one last thing as we look at this U offense. Ron Clark on, on the program this week said the U offense will look completely different with either Carlos Opie Croslin or Kareem Silky Smooth Moon behind center. Do you think that this is an opportunity for Jason Sisson to step up and take lead on this offense? Or do you think, knowing the U as you do, they're going to go with the vets who have been in that position they're going to trust that homestead style of offense, keep things steady until Huff comes back for playoffs. If they're smart, they'll get back to that conventional use offense where they just line up with the big guys and pound the run, pound the run. And then once, you know, um, they bite, just go over top and with the high horses with Mims and, and Big Smoke and all those guys. So I think that um, if they're smart, they'll just play conventional youth football. Well, that's Jaquan Mason. You can hear him on the table, and you can see what he brings to the table. Thank you so much, buddy, for joining us here on the pregame pod. No, thank you. And once again, bro, you're a rock star, man. I appreciate working with you, man. Thank you for everything. Uh, you're a mensch. Now let's go back to when Big Rob and Jay Mason tried to make Ant Live melt under the hot lights at the table. So I'm going to just say that we are – still in transition right yeah. no excuse no excuse um buzz came up they played a great game um all kudos to them but at the same time they didn't do sh shit like everything we ran was wide open um lenny had some great passes um what i can say is that we was playing in 13 mile per hour winds. It, it was windy. Out there. It <laughs> the wind was, windy. The wind the wind a, was a big in factor. Both games. Yeah, in both games. The wind was a big factor. Um, but, I mean, it is what it is. Our offense, like I said, scored 20 points. And we scored, we had seven on the point, on the board. So, you do the math. What did you see out there, Killer? Because you, you were there too. You were actually on the sideline a little bit. You were talking to some players. What did you see? when you saw the buzz go against the Snow Tribe, which, in my opinion, was still one of the better games of the day. Like, I, I was excited to watch that game. What did you because notice? That, the, the game actually went down to the, the last drive that the Facts. Snow Tribe... The, uh, the, the last drive that the Snow Tribe had. They right. actually went down. I, like, I wish... All right, let me get to this, right? What, this is my camera? Hey, listen. Hey, hey Kills. You got to play better, bro. Like, you have to. Like, the defense... They did what they did. You get what I'm saying? But you got to play better. It's just like, there's a lot of times you could have took off. You should have ran. Right. You know, like, I understand you got your playmakers. You want to get them involved. But at the end of the day, like, when the game's on the line, gotta like, right you got to be the guy. Like, the same thing I was saying about Marcel a couple years back when he was like, oh, he he gave up. He this, he that. Like, bro, you got to play better, bro. Because at the end of the day, you play better. Y'all win that game easily. Because everything was wide open. The defense was playing good. Everything was wide open. So, that was, that's pretty much what I felt about the game. And... On the other side, on the flip side, the um buzz, the deep the buzz defense actually played pretty, it's pretty well. Good. It's they pretty stopped good. the run. Um, I didn't really see too much from the offense. I mean, Lenny got some plays off, and I just think it was a lot of miscues on um uh, um the Snow Tribe defense. But other than that, man, it was a pretty good game. It, I just wish that you know both offenses just stepped up. Um, but that's pretty much what I got from it. And I have to agree with both of you in certain aspects, and then just add a little something where that wind was. Terrible. 
So there's some plays Lenny had where he was throwing the ball. Mm -hmm. It might have not connected because the wind was throwing the passes off so so viciously. Like initially, I didn't think it was that bad. I stepped outside. I saw the the signs being rolled across the yeah, field. Rolled across right. the field. Rolled across the field. So I'm, the wind was bad. So I'm really not gonna be hypercritical on quarterbacks. Right. Um. Like you know, we probably usually would have been mm -hmm. in a week to week situation, but Lenny and the DC Buzz, great win. Right. Great win. Great win. But honestly, you guys know, like I know. It is a long season for y'all. Y'all still have a gauntlet. Y'all still have a couple teams that's not going to be cool with y'all scoring on defense only. The offense does have to produce. Mm -hmm. And the defense has to be ready for bigger games because they did allow a lot of a lot of mistakes in where Snow Tribe didn't score came from Snow Tribe. It right. didn't necessarily come right. from right. the DC bus stopping it. It was more so Snow Tribe miscommunications. Some people want to do this. Kills told me a couple times he had a hard time controlling the huddle. Your quarterback, brother, you gotta you gotta control them off. You know what I'm saying? You gotta Let's take a look at some of the other stories and games trending around the A7FL as we go to our own Zach Morgan. Zach, what's going on around the league this Sunday? Taking a look around the league at a couple matchups with playoff implications, the undefeated Sin City Chaos take on the also undefeated Covington Heist in a battle for supremacy in the Midwest. And over in Vegas, the OTT, who have been a pleasant surprise allowing only six points and starting the season off at 2-0, will take on the Vegas Force, who need to win in order to stay alive after dropping their first two games of the season. From the A7FL Northeast Division, I'm Zachary Morgan. And our last look in this week is in Nevada as the defending champion Insomniacs got the win last week and prepare to remain undefeated but sick with it, trying their way to climb the charts. Let's go to Dub Alvarez as he looks ahead to week four. Thank you, Matt Ryan. Double A, Anthony Alvarez here with you live from Nevada. And here's what's going on on the west side here in week four. Two winless teams between the goal and the pit bosses. Somebody will finally experience the thrill of victory. In game two, can OTT continue to take the next step in wanting to be a prime player in this division? They'll take on the Las Vegas Force. And speaking of the Force, which version are we going to get today? The one that took the Insomniacs to the limit in Week 1? Or the one that got shot out last week by Cichlinid? In the game of the week, two unbeatens, Kryptonite, Insomniacs, who will take the first L? And in the nightcap, speaking of Cichlinid, how many points will they put on the Hunters tonight? Join myself, Scott McCorkle, and Chris Vera as we call it all. Matt, back to you. Thanks, Dub. And on that note, we will take a look around the A7FL in Nevada. And we will start with your scoreboard from this past Sunday. And, well, things got started a little early in Nevada on the offensive side. It was 40-6. to the gold falling to the kryptonite, and then a little bit later on in the day, the pit bosses would try to keep it close, but would fall to the Insomniacs as the national champions, win 46-18. And two teams that were hot on the defending champions heels. Well, one team is still there, the other one lagging behind is sick with it, would dog walk the force 34 to nothing. And in our final game, the OTT would beat the Hunters 44-6. In our nightcap, we take a look at the standings in Nevada as the Insomniacs lead with three victories on the season, no losses, and they've outscored their opponents 134 to 43. OTT in the two slot with sick with it right behind them. The only reason OTT in the two spot right now is due to net points. They've outscored the sick with it so far this season. Kryptonite in the four spot as they have scored as many points as OTT but have given up six more. So they are in fourth. The Vegas Force in fifth. The Pit Bosses, the Gold, and the Hunters in the six, seven, and eight spot. <laughs> And that'll do it for this edition of the Pre-Game Pod. Want to thank my guests and everyone who contributed to this program. But don't fret, don't worry. A7FL football throws off in just a few hours. Or, if you're watching this on YouTube, a few minutes away. So be prepared. Go to A7FL.TV. Get locked, get loaded. Week 4 throws off 
at 1 o'clock Eastern, so be sure to join us when we are live across the country as Season 10 rolls on for all of us here in the lovely confines of the shipping container. I'm Matt Ryan saying so long, farewell, we'll see you at Throw Off.